Hello and welcome to today's webinar, uh, a perimeter estimation model for VRF heat pump systems and presented by Aziz Mbaye. My name is Aisha and I would like to welcome you all. Today's session will be recorded and available on demand. If you have any issues hearing the presentation, please message us via Zoom and we will help you troubleshoot. So this Zoom webinar is hosted, uh, hosted by the IBIPSA USA Research Committee. Our goal is to share new ideas from research to the building simulation community. We welcome your questions, thoughts, and ideas as we continue to work towards IBIPSA USA's mission of fostering better buildings through simulation. During the webinar, you'll be muted and um, off camera during the session, but please participate by posting your question in the QA tab to the bottom of your screen and by entering any comments in the chat. By default, the chat is set to send to just the presenters, so be sure to click down the arrow next to the chat and select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see your message. At the end of 40-minute presentation, I'll unmute our audience on Zoom for a discussion with Aziz. Now, I would like to introduce Aziz Mbaye. Uh, who is a mechanical engineer with a background in the development of new energy systems and is currently pursuing a PhD at Polytechnic Montreal. His research focuses on the development of VRF simulation tools for performance evaluation and control strategy implementation. Aziz received the award for best paper at the two, uh, 2022 IBIPSA USA BPAC SimBuild conference for his paper on this topic. So please join me in welcoming Aziz and thank you, Aziz. Okay, thank you, uh, Aziz Gul, for, for the presentation. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, the IBIPSA USA uh, Research Committee for organizing uh, this uh, this webinar. Uh, and uh, as uh, as it is said, uh, we will discuss today uh, the development of a new VRF model that aims towards multi-use simulation. Uh, And uh, here is uh, our plan today. First of all, I'm gonna uh, lay out the context around VRF uh, heat pumps systems that uh, justify what we are doing right now. And then uh, I will go through uh, the methodology and uh, our, our modeling approach. And uh, finally, uh, we will have uh, uh, discussions about uh, uh, the future work and uh, as well as uh, answering your your questions. So uh, before going deep into uh, our today's topic, I would like to learn more about the attendance. So uh, uh, we have a pool of uh, a couple of questions that you can uh, answer on the directly uh, on the on the Zoom pools. Oh, that's great. I'm seeing that uh, most people uh, of the audience are uh, professional of uh, energy professionals. That's great. And are very, very uh, aware of uh, VRF technology. So we have a very uh, good audience here.
Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna share the results. So uh, it's like uh, most people here have a good knowledge of uh, VRF systems. And uh, most of you guys also are uh, either engineer or energy professional. So that's great. So uh, as you uh, might know, variable refrigerant flow heat pumps are uh, variable capacity uh, multi-split technology, primarily uh, targeted at commercial heating and cooling applications. And uh, while traditional heat pump technology is almost seven years old, variable refrigerant flow were introduced to the market only uh, at the late 80s. And uh, ever since VRF are, contest, are constantly uh, growing uh, in popularity. And uh, if we all look at, uh, at uh, some uh, market overview here, in Europe and Asia, the market share of uh, VRF heat pumps represent approximately 80 to 90% uh, of uh, HVAC systems in the, in the commercial building. And uh, recent market reports in North America have identified VRF as the fastest growing uh, technology in the, in the HVAC market uh, with more than 15% of uh, annual growth but its market share is still uh, relatively low. So it represents like three to 5% of uh, the total HVAC market in the, in the US. And uh, a typical VRF system include usually one outdoor unit located uh, outside of the building or uh, on the top of the building and which supplies the refrigerant to uh, several variety of, uh, of indoor unit located inside dif in different zone of, uh, of the building. And uh, in cooling mode, for example, the outdoor unit here operates as the condenser while, uh, uh, and will supply the refrigerant through the piping system here inside the building uh, to uh, different, uh, to, to the vertical units, the floor ceiling, uh, the, the ceiling units or the, the floor console unit, which are all indoor, indoor units. And uh, when a heat recovery unit is added to the system, uh, the VRF uh, is able to provide simultaneous heating and cooling uh, to different zones of, uh, of the same building with, with high, high efficiency. Uh, the outdoor unit uh, that I showed before is a set made uh, is a set that include one or several compressors, uh, one or several heat exchanger uh, as well, and uh, uh, a four way valves that allow to uh, to reverse the cycle. And uh, each indoor unit uh, include a heat exchanger, which is the evaporator in uh, cooling mode or uh, the condenser in heating mode and uh, an uh, expansion valve. And for, for air to air system, a fan is usually uh, added to the system uh, in order to circulate the air in, uh, in the room. Uh, the heat recovery unit here acts as the branch controller for simultaneous heating and cooling operation to help recover and redistribute, redistribute the heat uh, between the zones. And uh, finally, the operation of, uh, of a VRF is uh, very similar to, uh, to that of a conventional heat pump system, except that here for the VRF, the refrigerant flow rate in the indoor units uh, will be controlled here by its own valve and according to, uh, to, to its load. And from this disruption, it is um, clear that unlike traditional heat pumps, uh, a VRF configuration is unique to the building architecture, which is uh, which ultimately uh, impacts the size, the performance, and uh, the operation of, of the system. Also, VRF can include up to 100 indoor units, which will add more complexity uh, to the design and the operation of, uh, of the building uh, HVAC system. And uh, moreover, as HVAC professionals, you guys might, might know, uh, the VRF designs, the piping sizing, and uh, even the control system 
are performed using uh, some proprietary software usually provided by, by, by the manufacturer. This means that unlike a more traditional non-VRF heat pump system, uh, like just a, a chilled water, uh, a building order is tied to the manufacturer for the entire life of, uh, of the system. And it is important also to note that one cannot integrate a VRF system component from one manufacturer into another system provided by another manufacturer. So uh, there are some uh, of the reason why uh, to support the development of VRF system to facilitate their design and uh, to evaluate their performances. It is necessary to have validated flexible simulation tool at uh, reduced computational time and open source also that uh, will help predict their energy consumption. And uh, as of today, there are several non-proprietary uh, VRF models implemented in different building simulation, uh, uh, building energy simulation tools like Energy Plus, Transis, uh, Equest, and so on. And those models uh, range from detailed physics uh, model to equation fit model with varying level of, uh, of accuracy. So the most basic approach to, uh, to model steady state VRF system is commonly called the black box model, uh, according to which the capacity and the electricity consumption of the system are described using a regression function, uh, most often based on uh, manufacturer performance data or in certain case uh, by using measurements results uh, carried out in, uh, in labs. And uh, black box models uh, are very uh, easy uh, to use, but they have an error margin of uh, up to 25% in average, which is not, for build, which is not ideal in some case for building energy simulation. Uh, regarding the physics-based model, uh, they use the most of time, most of the time, first principle equations to describe to describe the behavior of uh, of the VRF, uh, which is why they are more accurate in predicting uh, the performance of uh, of the system. But they require a knowledge of uh, of the model parameters, which is not an easy task, especially uh, for uh, commercial units where we do not have inside information uh, of, uh, uh, of the system. And uh, due to their, to, to their complexity, uh, they can be very computationally expensive, making it difficult if you want to simulate system with uh, up to 100 indoor, indoor units. And uh, for us, our approach is uh, uh, to, to develop an air source VRF model using uh, uh, a simplified vapor compression cycle with only uh, three thermodynamic points as shown is, uh, in this uh, pressure enthalpy diagram here. Uh, and we made some, some assumptions. The first one is uh, there is no subcooling in the system, meaning that uh, the refrigerant leaves the condenser, the point C here in a saturated liquid, liquid state. And also uh, the refrigerant is leaving the evaporator here at the point B in a superheated vapor state with a constant degree of, uh, of superheating during the whole operation of, uh, of the system. And uh, the sensible heat transfer uh, from the point A to point B in the evaporator is neglected uh, as it is very small compared to the latent heat transfer here. Uh, the expansion process uh, through the electronic expansion valve here is as enthalpic, and uh, the pressure drops within the heat exchangers as well as those in the refrigerant pipes are neglected. And uh, the assumptions on, on the compressor model will be discussed later in the, in the presentation. But such cycle has the benefit of lowering the computational time since limited refrigerant state will be evaluated. Here, we will need to evaluate only a three refrigerant state. It also reduces the number of model parameters 
to ease the calibration procedure that we will uh, use to find uh, the model parameter. And uh, finally, to ensure the model flexibility, the indoor units and the outdoor units, as well as the heat recovery unit uh, will be mod modeled separately and their parameters are will be inferred from uh, a calibration procedure uh, using manu available manufacturer data. So first we will go through the detail of, uh, of the models and then uh, I will discuss the calibration procedure. And uh, the last part, we will uh, uh, look at uh, some uh, validation results of, uh, of, the, uh, of, a VR, of a VRF uh, system. So let's go to, uh, to, the, to the component models. Uh, I'm gonna start here for the, for the indoor unit. And the indoor unit uh, is represented as uh, an air to refrigerant heat exchanger that will operate at constant refrigerant temperature. And its component, uh, its behavior uh, is described using the efficiency uh, NTU method. And the model has only two parameters, right? The first one is the thermal conductance between the refrigerant and the coil inside surface, uh, which is called UA ref here. And the second parameters, uh, parameter is the thermal conductance between the moist air and uh, the coil outside surface, the UAC. And to take into account the condensation in cooling mode, the outside surface of the coil is considered fully wet. And uh, in this case, the global heat transfer coefficient is expressed by this given equation uh, where we have here the two parameters and uh, here CPA S and CPA are respectively the heat capacity of the entering air and the heat capacity of the saturated air evaluated at the refrigerant temperature. And in heating mode, the global heat transfer coefficient uh, of, a, of the dry coil, uh, coil will be evaluated here without the capacity correction. And uh, for the outdoor unit model, uh, it consists of uh, uh, two components. The first one is the heat exchanger, and the second one is the, the compressor. So uh, the heat exchanger model will be the same as for the indoor unit. And uh, for, for, for the compressor model, we consider a scroll compressor model where the mechanical work is a result of uh, two successive processes. The first one is an isentropic compression as the, uh, at, the comp at the compressor built-in volume ratio, and uh, which is followed by an isochoric compression to the discharge pressure. And uh, the, the result of the, the total compressor uh, work uh, is evaluated by this uh, uh, equation here. And then the indoor unit, and the outdoor unit models are implemented in uh, Modelica as they are in, intended to be part of the Modelica IBIPSA library. And uh, for those who are not familiar with Modelica, Modelica is a freely available object oriented and a causal language for modeling large complex physical systems. Uh, and it provides object-oriented constructs that facilitate the reuse of, uh, of the model as they are described by, uh, by schematics. And here we first uh, implemented the, uh, the model of uh, the different components, the indoor unit model here, the outdoor unit, which is represented here by the compressor and uh, here the heat exchanger of, uh, of the outdoor unit. And uh, finally, the global VRF model will be the combination of uh, all those models, the outdoor unit model and uh, several indoor units here. And as the implementation is vector-based, so this model is, is able uh, to simulate system with large number of, uh, of indoor units. We also add some control blocks here, available on the IBIPSA building library in, uh, in order to uh, uh, to facilitate the control and uh, the simulation of, uh, of the model. And uh, at this point, the global VRF model parameters are unknown. 
right? And uh, our approach is to estimate them by calibration using money, available manufacturer data. So all the parameters that uh, we have in the heat exchanger and in the compressor will be uh, uh, will be estimated by uh, by calibration. And uh, from from the manufacturer data, we uh, we implemented in Python a parameter estimation procedure using uh, the Modelica based model that uh, that we just saw. Uh, and such procedure aims to find parameters that will minimize uh, a cost function. And for the indoor unit, the available performance data uh, include the total capacity, uh, like in this example, the total capacity and the sensible capacity, uh, which are given for different sets of uh, outdoor temperature and uh, indoor uh, dry bulb and uh, wet bulb temperature, as well as different flow rates. And the cost function associated to the indoor unit is uh, represented here by this equation, uh, which is equal to the sum of the squared error of the sensible capacity and uh, the sum of the squared error of uh, the latent, latent capacity. And uh, this flow chart here uh, shows how the parameter estimation procedure uh, works. So first of all, we have our model, right? Our indoor unit model, we, uh, which have two parameters. And uh, at the input, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna put the different dry bulb and wet bulb temperature that we have in the uh, manufacturer data table, uh, as well as the mass flow rate. And we're gonna compute at the output the total capacity and the sensible capacities. And then we're gonna compare those values to the value that was given by the, the manufacturer and uh, the model by iteration, we'll uh, uh, try to, uh, we'll find the parameters that will minimize the error between those two values. And here is an example of uh, the calibration procedure tested here on an indoor unit of uh, a nominal capacity of uh, 3.5 kilowatt from the manufacturer Daikin. And uh, here we represented the result for the latent capacities here in the X axis where we have the manufacturer value and on the Y axis, we have uh, the value of, uh, of the model. And uh, we have the results here for the latent capacity here, the sensible capacity, and finally for the total capacity. And uh, the calibration results so that uh, for this particular indoor unit, uh, the parameter will be uh, the a UA ref of uh, 1543 watt per Kelvin and a UAC of uh, 1567 uh, uh, watt per Kelvin. And uh, the, total, uh, the total error of uh, uh, for those performances for the lot, uh, for, uh, are given here by the root mean, root mean square error, uh, which is uh, relatively low. So uh, we have here a good calibration result for this, uh, this particular unit. As for the outdoor unit, the, the available manufacturer data are here the total capacity of the system and uh, the, uh, the, compress the total power com consumption, which take into account the compressor uh, electricity, electricity consumption, as well as the, the fan electricity consumption of uh, the, the, the heat exchanger uh, fan. And uh, the calibration procedure will identify eight parameters here for the outdoor unit uh, model, uh, two parameters for the heat exchanger and uh, six other parameters here for, for, for the compressor. And the associated cost function for, for the outdoor unit uh, is the sum of the squared error of uh, the total capacity and the sum of the squared error of uh, the power consumption. And uh, as uh, uh, we have previously shown uh, for the indoor unit model, we set here a calibration example for the outdoor unit using uh, an outdoor unit of uh, 10.5 kilometer from 
from from Daikin, and uh, uh, we have here the calibration result for uh, the first. Uh, the first diagram here is uh, the, the the capacity result, and the second one is the the power results, right? And we uh, we also have a, a very small error of uh, uh, for for the capacity and uh, and the power consumption. So uh, at this stage, we develop the VRF model, and we are able to find its parameters by, by calibration. So uh, the last part will be to uh, try to validate uh, the VRF model using uh, existing, uh, existing data from, uh, uh, from, from a system. And uh, to do so, we simulated uh, the calibrated VRF model, and uh, the results are compared against data that are moni uh, monitored from the HVAC system at the, the ASHRI uh, headquarter building uh, located in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, the data were recorded from a VRF system that uh, uh, of 22 indoor units uh, that served the zones of the building first floor. And uh, the system also include two rooftop outdoor units and the data were collected during a two year uh, of operation from 2011 to 2013. So this picture here shows the first floor plan uh, divided into uh, 22 zones and the indoor unit size of these zones uh, range from uh, two kilowatt to 14 kilowatt. And also the outdoor unit have a nominal capacity of uh, 49 kilowatt each. And for the comparison, we consider a simulation period of uh, 60 days, going from July to August 2011, and uh, where the system operated in cooling mode only. So we, we focus here our comparison for, for the cooling mode only. Uh, and uh, this figure so uh, show the a comparison between the measured power here in the, in blue and the simulated results in red here for a typical week and uh, there's there's results are for the second week of uh, the simulation period uh, which goes from uh, July 9 here to uh, July 15 and we can notice a good fit between the measured power uh, and, the and the simulated results, especially uh, for the first five days of the week, uh, for weekdays. And uh, during the weekend here, the last day of, uh, of our simulation uh, uh, of our week, the VRF simulated power is higher than the value that is uh, measured. Uh, and this trend remain the same, pretty much the same for the entire simulation period. Uh, the result also, also show that the model is able to capture the demand peaks here, even though we have uh, some, uh, some gap. Uh, but the power variation of our model is uh, smoother than the one that is measured uh, inside, uh, inside the building. And here we, uh, we have the power variation for a typical day uh which which is the this our selected week first day and we also represented the variation of the number of indoor units here that are operating during during the day and we can notice that the power troughs and ridges here uh, follows perfectly the indoor units activation and the gap on the power peaks between the model and the measured data as well as the quick increase here of uh, the simulated power during startup period, which is equivalent here for the morning warm up, can be explained by the fact that the ASHRAE VRF system features eight different compressors, while our model uses a simplified assumption, just one equivalent compressor that has a volume flow rate that equals the value of the eight compressors combined. And this is why for, for small capacities or small value of number of indoor units, 
the, the, the simulated power here uh, is higher uh, than the, the, the measured value uh, of the power. We also uh, perform some, uh, stat uh, some statistical error analysis here on the, on the daily energy consumption. And uh, we have uh, here first uh, for, for the relative error, uh, a wise quartering uh, here of the error of the daily energy error of, uh, of the VRF that, uh, that is uh, simulated and the error range from uh, basically uh, zero here to uh, up to uh, 43%. But if we take into account all those errors for the entire simulation period, the aggregated relative error is around 4%, which is relatively low. And we also uh, evaluated some statistical errors here for, for a daily time scale and uh, for, the, for, the, for the instantaneous data, which are recorded for a five minute uh, time step. And based on the instantaneous data, the CVRS, uh, the CVRMNC, the, the coefficient of variation of the root mean square error and the uh, normalized mean bias error are 33.5% and 4.5% uh, respectively. And for a, day, for, for a daily time scale, those value are basically 21% and 8%. And for reference, the ASHRAE, uh, the guideline, uh, the calibration criteria from the ASHRAE uh, guideline 14 uh, for an hourly uh, time scale for calibrated system are 30% and 10% respectively for the CV, RMSC, and the N NMBE. So for conclusion, we uh, first develop a VRF model that is able to simulate system with large number of indoor unit. And the comparison that we uh, just discussed here uh, showed that we have a good fit between uh, the model and the simulated data. And uh, in order to uh, improve the, the model accuracy, uh, we need first to extend, to extend it uh, toward the use of, of multi-compressors uh, to help capture better the to, to help better capture the the power variation uh, especially in peak demands and uh, by doing so this will require the development of an adequate capacity control strategy for the compressors of on signal we are also currently finalizing the the implementation of uh, the heat recovery unit to allow the simulation of uh, the simultaneous heating and cooling uh, operation and uh, once the, the implementation of the heat recovery unit uh, is, is done, the model will be validated using the whole, the, the complete data uh, recorded from, uh, from the ASHRAE uh, headquarters building. Uh, also improving the model accuracy will, uh, will also require taking into account the effect, the, the effect of the pressure drops due to the piping length uh, which can be uh, significant, especially uh, for systems with a large number of, uh, of indoor units. Uh, here is an, an overview of uh, the improved VRF model, uh, which, is, which in addition to the main component, the outdoor unit, the compressor here and the indoor units, uh, we added some new one, some Especially, new uh, system. Sorry. Uh, do we have a question here in the audience? Go ahead, Aziz, with your uh, presentation. We can take questions at the end. Thank uh, you. Okay, great. So. Uh, I was saying that in addition to the main component that uh, we, we have, we just added a new one to, uh, to handle the system control and operation. And those models are here, the heat recovery unit uh, that is used for the cycle reversal to switch from heating to cooling operation. But more importantly, the heat recovery unit model here uh, performs the branch selection for the simultaneous heating and cooling uh, operation. 
We also ha have here the heat recovery unit controller, which defines the VRF operation mode based on the number of units that we have and uh, based on the load on, on those units. And uh, we also have here the compressor uh, controller that uh, ensure the, the VRF capacity control during uh, part load operation by defining the number of compressors to turn on depending on the load of the system. And uh, let me show here an early glimpse of uh, the results that we have uh, with this improved model. Uh, here for the same selected week as before. And uh, we can see that here, the compressor control strategy, uh, which is based on just uh, exploiting the manufacturer data. Uh, then from this data, we developed a machine learning algorithm to predict the active, um, the active number of compressors that we, uh, we, we need to have for a given operating condition, for a given operating condition. And uh, we can see here that most of the time, the, the controller is able to predict the adequate number of compressor to be activated. But uh, we, we, we have some, uh, uh, some outliers here as uh, it is still work in progress uh, uh, in order to, uh, to improve the, the, the compressor uh, accuracy. But nevertheless, if we, focus, if we focus only on the total energy consum consumption uh, during the two months of uh, cooling operation, uh, by using the, the, eight com the, the, several, the, the different compressors and uh, by using this uh, control strategy, uh, the, uh, the model is able to, uh, uh, to simulate the result with uh, a total error around 1%, which is, uh, which is quite good knowing that the purpose of the model is not to capture the instantaneous data, but uh, the model is aimed towards multi-year simulation, so simulation for, for a long period of time of, uh, of VRS systems. But we, uh, we, we're still working on it, especially uh, for, the compress, uh, for, for, the, for the controller as well as for the indoor, uh, for, for the heat recovery unit uh, in order to uh, better handle also uh, the simultaneous heating and, uh, and cooling uh, operation. And uh, that's it for, for the presentation. We have some uh, bibliography here, and uh, I will be glad to uh, hear your comments, guys, and as well as uh, answering to, uh, to your questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Aziz. Um, there are a couple questions that are in the Q&A um, section of the Zoom webinar, um, we'll go ahead and answer those first. And then for the attendees that do still have questions, you're more than welcome to also raise your hand and um, we can unmute you so that you can um, talk directly with Aziz. Um, Aziz, I'll go ahead and read out the questions, but I'm sure you can also see them as well. Um, yeah. The first question comes from Demba. Um, they ask, does the parameter estimation consider the part load data? Uh, no, when uh... Uh, when we are calibrating the model, we are calibrating the model uh, during full load operation, and uh, right after when when we when we have implemented the the capacity control strategies based using the the different control uh, the different compressors and uh, um, the model. So this is when we're gonna use the part load data of uh, of the manufacturer uh tables in order to uh to to set the the the, the control strategy uh, uh for for the part load operation perfect um demba i allowed you to unmute yourself if you have any follow-up to that um and i'll also read the second question that was inputted um, they also ask, were the same data used in this validation used to try to see what would be the performance of an eQuest model or Energy Plus model? Uh, not yet. So uh, right now, uh, our, me our measuring stick is the data that are recorded in, 
uh, in the ASHRAE building. So we are uh, comparing the result of the model after calibration uh, to the data da recorded in the in the ASHRAE uh, uh, building. But maybe yeah, it might be a good idea to uh, to compare uh the the model that we uh, that we have uh, with those on uh, energy plus or or request uh, in order to uh, uh to make a comparison of uh, of their uh, respective accuracy wonderful thank you aziz um and the last question currently in the q a box um this is from an anonymous attendee they ask why was this model produced when simulation software already exists that can produce system models? And what is the application of this custom model? Yeah, the, that's a great idea. So I I, I think uh, I, uh, I I spoke about it briefly. Uh, uh, so right now, the, the model that we have in most of the software are using a black box model with an accuracy of uh, around 25%, right? And uh, also uh, this model, if we project ourselves further, uh, if, we, uh, if we want to implement some control strategies uh, in order to increase the performance of the VRF, uh, uh, of the VRF, the, this type of model, uh, are not suitable for for control uh, strategy strategies implementation. So uh, one one advantage uh, of such model is uh, uh, if we can go further uh, to uh, to to allow us to implement some control strategies on uh, on on VRF. And on top of that, it simulates right now the VRF with very large number of indoor units with. Uh, uh, quite good accuracy. Thank you. Um, I see that there are some hands raised as well as questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll kind of hop back and forth. So I'll go ahead and first go to Drew Morrison. Um, I'll let you talk if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, sure, thanks. Um, so I, I like the... Um, you know, I like the fact that this model has been calibrated to cooling data, and uh, but I'm I'm curious, um, are there any plans to extend this, uh, you know, this physics-based model to cold climate VRF systems, which have, uh, you know, a, a slightly more complex refrigeration cycle with often, you know, um, you know, with often some kind of intercooler or flash economizer or a two-stage compression. So. Um, you know, are, are you planning to extend this to capture, you know, that those kinds of systems for, you know, for more northern climates that have uh, some additional heating demands? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a good point here, uh, because you know the, the, the purpose of having the simplified uh, cycle here is to lower the parameter, uh, the model parameters as well as. Uh, to facilitate the the calibration procedure, uh, if we add more complexity uh, on the cycle, it might be uh, it, it might be ask more on uh, uh, computation time uh, for for the calibration, and we will have more par uh, more model parameters, and and maybe those parameters won't be able to be found uh, by calibration using manufacturer data. Uh, but right now, it can uh, we can calibrate the model for heating and cooling, uh, just for, for 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 the vast majority of uh, of VRF system. But I think it more work needs to be done in order to. Uh, um, to represent a uh, more complex system. All right, thank you. Thanks, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Um, Bianca, you are up next. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I find the use case very interesting because it's something that um, I would love to use your model. Uh, but one of the things I'm interested in is trying to look at kind of the I guess you mentioned it as instantaneous kind of power consumption from the heat pump. So I was curious to know if you had thought about what elements might be leading to like your averaging behavior that you saw on your plot, as opposed to capturing those kind of peak and kind of squiggly, for lack of a better word, kind of time series. 
Yeah, I uh, I think that right now our control strategy is uh, uh, is very simple. is it is it, just based on the combination ratio of the system, uh, as well as the temperature at the load and uh, at the source of uh, of the VRS system, and uh, and we know that. Uh, in in a, in a real system, uh, the the variable that are using for for uh, for for the control strategies are are more diverse, and uh, we still uh, we we also have some uh, um, some pressure drop, we, which add some uh, some inertia into the system, and this is why so we do not have by pressure drop, we do not uh, take into account the. Uh, the the refrigerant and uh, and the piping uh, length. This is why our model is uh, the variation of our model is uh, is very uh, uh, is quicker uh, since we, we we do not have uh, some some capacity. Uh, adding to that that the the control strategies that we are using to uh, to, to 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 identify the the proper number of uh, compressor. To, to be run is uh, is very simple. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Bianca, for your question. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Um, the next one is from Nicholas, um, and they ask, did you perform a sensitivity analysis to understand which parameters are the most important for the model? Uh, not, uh, uh, not rigorously. Uh, I, we do not uh, we do not do it specially, but by uh, making the simulation and by going through the calibration procedure, we can uh, see that uh, the the compressor uh, parameters are uh, are very important uh, because uh, you know an error of uh, I mean 10, 20 percent on the on the compressor parameter can give us a very uh, uh, different system uh, compared to the value of uh, the the thermal conductance of uh, of the heat exchanger, uh, where we we can tolerate to have uh, uh, more error on uh, uh, on those values. But it might be a good idea to perform a, a real sensitivity analysis to uh, uh, in order to uh, to be. Uh, uh, more uh, clear about about this question. Wonderful, thank you, Aziz. The next question in the Q and A box um, comes from an anonymous attendee asking um, regarding the error margin of the black box model. In their case, Energy Plus or E Plus. Um, can I get more explanation for this in more detail? Uh, yeah, for uh, sure. So uh, if I try to go back here to the presentation, um, I think here, uh, generally, uh, black box model are just, you know, equations that fit the model uh, with not real physics meaning, uh, not real physical meaning. And um, uh, some uh, it is well documented. There are some uh, lot of articles on that, uh, showing that the error made on the uh, on the total um, uh, energy consumption uh, using uh, this black box model, uh, the one of uh, of energy plus, especially uh, uh, deliver results with around twenty five percent of 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 error, but. Uh, we can live with that, knowing that uh, when we when we perform uh, building uh, energy simulation, uh, the error is usually are, uh, between fifteen to twenty percent, even for the building model itself. So uh, I think we we, we can we, we can live with that. But if we can, if you want to have more accurate model with. Uh, uh, with uh, maybe uh, the ability uh, to uh, to implement control strategies, black box black box model are not the uh, the the good answer. Thank you, Aziz, for your explanation. Um, it looks like there are no more questions in the Q and A box, and no more hands raised. So, Aisha, I will hand it back to you. 
Um, thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, Aziz, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining this IBIPSA USA Research Committee thank webinar. You. Uh, and if you enjoy this webinar, please consider joining the IBIPSA USA Research Committee. And you can email us um, through research at ibipsa.us or uh, we provided a link in the chat below. I did now. So you can um, use that link to sign up. And for those who are watching us on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So next month on March 13th, uh, we will have Diksha Rastogi and presenting on modeling climate extremes for impact assessment. So you can sign up the event through the, the link that I am providing right now. Um, so hope to see you all there. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.